Today is Tuesday, July 1st, 2008. My name is Mark DePew. I'm the Director of Oral History here at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. I said here, but actually where we're at right now is with Jay Johnson, who is the President of Johnson Grain Company. Is that right, Jay? That is correct. And uh, normally I start with a little background, but I think it might be appropriate today to have you explain to us where we're at right now. Well, right now we're in Waverly, Illinois, which uh, we're just uh, east of Waverly, about three miles, uh, just into Sangamon County. And we are at uh, the Johnson Shuttle. And what the Johnson Shuttle is, is it is a grain terminal, which uh, we bring corn in from the local farmers and we ship the corn to Texas and Mexico uh, for cattle feed. And uh, the reason why it's called a shuttle is because we ship 110 car unit trains, which are, uh, by the railroad standards, are called shuttle trains. Okay. There is an awful lot of activity that's going on here, which I think is perfect. Um, out to your left sh shoulder here, uh, we see some grain trucks going by. The facility we're in right now is what? We are in the scale house right now. And uh, when the trucks come in, they... Uh, they get probed, we take a sample of the grain, and then they get weighed here at the scale house before they proceed to the dump pits. Okay, and I think over your shoulder here, the camera can kind of catch a lot of those trucks going by and moving to uh, dump the grain and so it can get loaded into the cars, right? That is correct. Well, we're going to spend a lot more time talking about that. Um, I love all this activity going on in the background, and it's a, it's a gorgeous uh, July day in Illinois, so it's not a bad time to be out here at all. Let's start with a little bit of background, though. Uh, when and where were you born, Jay? I was born in Springfield, Illinois, in 1967, on November the 6th. Okay. Just turned 40 here uh, last November. Well, happy belated birthday to you. Well, thank you. <laughs> does it feel like 40 years now? Well, yeah, it does. <laughs> you didn't grow up in Springfield, though, did you? I grew up in Waverly. I grew up just north of Waverly, and... Uh, we were in a uh, tenant farmhouse in my, uh, my parents' farm, and uh, we moved uh, to uh, east of Waverly, which uh, my parents live now, which is not too far from the shuttle location. Uh, moved there when I was in the seventh grade. Okay, and your dad was primarily farming at that time? My father was a farmer uh, all the way from uh, when he got out of high school, farmed, and in 1975, uh, bought a few trucks and uh, got a grain dealer's license and started into uh, the grain business in 1975 uh, with a uh, basically just a truck to barge operation. Basically picked up grain on the farmers, uh, the farmers' bins and from the farmers' fields and hauled it to the Illinois River to be loaded on barge. When he started doing that, was it that his full-time job or that was just kind of a seasonal thing? He was that, was, uh, that was that was just a seasonal thing, uh, part-time, uh, kind of supplement the farm uh, income. Uh, my parents had five children. I'm number four of, of five. And uh, I think it was to, uh, he saw an opportunity mm -hmm. uh, and uh, thought that uh, he could help provide for his family in that way. And I never will forget the comment. Uh, my dad said he made, uh, he's got some sisters that live in California in the first year, he made enough money to take the family to California, so that was that was nice. <laughs> a revelation after uh, kind of scraping by on, on farm income? Absolutely. Had not been on a vacation, family vacation, so the, the grain business in 1975 allowed us to, to go see his uh, siblings in California as a family. What kind of farm operation did he have? My father was uh, primarily uh, a tenant farmer which means that uh, you rent from local landowners on a crop share basis back at that point in time. Uh, we went more to, to cash rents here in the, in the latest uh, uh, developments here in the last 10 years. But back then it was basically a crop share farming and, and owned a little bit of land and continued to buy just a little bit. But it was pretty much grain, it wasn't livestock at all? Uh, livestock was included back then in the in the 70s, it seemed like you, you had to have some livestock, and uh, so we had uh, cattle, um, and um, uh, don't think, I was, I was young at the time, born in 67, I remember feeding the cattle and watering the cattle, but I don't think we had any other livestock. If it was, it was before I was, I was born. I was going to say, I suspected that you had quite a few chores you had to do. I did. We, uh, 
we we were uh, like I said in the country and lived on a tenant farm so we were always busy uh, with the livestock or mowing or uh, back then you would would walk this the bean fields to uh, get the weeds out of it so we were we were kept pretty busy as kids any particular chores you really liked and didn't like well you know we didn't know any better so we just did what we had to do <laughs> Nothing uh, nasty in working with the cattle, though, that really didn't take a liking to? Well, there was, uh, there was one thing that when my dad did start in the grain business in 1975, I would go around with the truck drivers and help clean out the grain bins. It always seemed like summertime when we were out of school that that's when the farmers were getting to the bottom of their bins, silos, to clean out prior to uh, harvest time. And it seemed like I got to follow all the... Uh, truck drivers around and uh, and scoop grain bins so that's what I thought the grain business was so I uh, I didn't know if I wanted any part of that but uh, I since learned that that was just the education I needed yeah. to get going <laughs> yeah, just the inspiration how about your mother what's your mother's maiden name Tranquilly uh, Judith Ann Tranquilly born in 1942 and uh, obviously has an Italian uh, lineage okay um, did she uh, have another job, or is she pretty much busy keeping five kids in tow? Well, I believe my mother worked for a telephone company um, before I was born. And like I said, I was number four of five, so I think at that point in time she had a full-time job uh, providing for the kids and, mm -hmm. and uh, keeping, the, uh, keeping my father uh, uh, supplied with what he needed for his farming operation and grain business. You went to school here in Waverly then? Went to Waverly High School, grade school, high school. Uh, graduated from Waverly High School in 1986. Uh, proceeded on to Illinois State University in uh, Bloomington Normal and uh, got a four year degree there in uh, finance and uh, graduated in 1990. Okay, uh, you're moving along here pretty quick, Jay. That's okay. okay. Um, as a high school kid, what do you think you wanted to do with your life? other than not shovel grain maybe? Well, I didn't want anything to do with the grain business because I, I had grown up around it and I thought that you know I would be scooping bins uh, and that would be all I would be doing. Not, not that there's anything wrong with that. I could actually use some exercise now. I don't get enough of it, but uh, um, I thought that's what the grain business was and I never did really get to, into the, uh, the exciting and intriguing part that I, that I enjoy so much today. Mm -hmm. So what did you think you wanted to do? Well, I wanted to go to college and uh, get a degree and see what developed. And uh, as I went to college, I, I really took a liking to finance. I've always been, uh, uh, enjoyed working with numbers. And uh, so I, as I got uh, towards my junior, senior year, I started looking at the different uh, possibilities and I ended up in banking. So okay. that, I'm not sure that I, I had anything that I really wanted to do um, but I knew that I, I need to get an education, and at that point in time, uh, hopefully th something would come to me, and it did. And that was banking? That was banking, yes. Why banking, then? I think just my love for numbers and the financial part, and uh, not real sure exactly. I had some different uh, opportunities uh, coming out of college, uh, but I chose to go to work for uh, First Chicago, which uh, was downtown Chicago. thought it would be neat to experience the city and uh, see what it was like there. Was it? It was neat. It was neat. I spent a year and a half there, and that was long enough for a country boy, um, coming from a small town and uh, working in an operation with 16,000 employees and living downtown in downtown Chicago. It's a great place to visit for a, for a small town boy, but uh, I don't think that uh, I could have stayed there much longer. You were a bachelor at the time? I was. And he had an apartment downtown? I had an apartment downtown. Boy, you went from, you can't get much more rural than <laughs> Waverly, Illinois, and then you can't get more, more urban than downtown Chicago. That's right. Well, I wanted to experience that, and I did. And, and uh, at the time, my, my wife, uh, Kelly, uh, we were dating. She was a senior at Illinois State, so when I was in Chicago. So I was, uh, I was in Chicago, and, and she was back at the college, and... That would suggest you put a lot of miles on the road. I did. I, I did not have a car because I lived downtown, and I remember the parking garages were, were either full or the charges were, were astronomical. 
so I did a lot of uh, commuting by train or, or traveling weekends by train, uh, Amtrak to Bloomington. Um, what was it about living in downtown Chicago that uh, you liked and what you didn't like about it? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, what did I like? Um, I liked the experience of seeing what city life is like. Um, I liked the experience of working in a, for a large corporation. Um, I think it has made me appreciate the small business uh, of, the, of the world. Uh, not only ours, but for those that get an opportunity to work for small businesses, it seems like you're, uh, you're noticed a lot quicker in a small business. When you're in a large corporation, it takes you a long time to climb the ladder mm -hmm. and to uh, get to where you can make some decisions that you feel like you're probably capable of making long before you get to that point. So it sounds like you think that the Chicago experience and working in banking and in finance and that background was the ideal thing to lead you where you're at today then? I would say that it was a very good experience. I'm not saying it was ideal. I don't know what, what ideal would be, but mm -hmm. I do know that uh, living in the city for as long as I did made me appreciate the country. Uh, working for a large corporation uh, for a sh short time there, a year and a half, made me realize that small business was, was my preference. And then uh, being away from family for a year and a half and, and realizing how important family values are mm -hmm. and, and uh, being close to your, to your parents and your siblings uh, brought me back here to, to Johnson Grain. Now I know your dad, you said he got into shipping grain over to the, the uh, river about 1975, was that That's right? correct, yes. What happened between 75 and up to the time you were up in Chicago in the banking business for him? My father continued to uh, ship corn and, and soybeans uh, on truck to uh, the river. And the business was growing, uh, from what I remember, the business was doing very well in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, in the late 80s, there was uh, a lot of increased competition uh, doing the same thing that he was doing. My father uh, was one of the first, if not the first, to start picking up grain uh, directly on the farm. Prior to him getting in business, uh, the farmers would take out their straight trucks and their tandems and haul their corn to the local elevator. Uh, my father bought some trucks and would actually provide that on-farm service, uh, which was uh, a new concept and, and kind of a, of a pioneer in that uh, development. Uh, then as uh, time progressed, other competition started doing the same thing and then it got very, very difficult to, uh, to uh, continue the growth uh, with the same type of uh, market plan. Mm -hmm. Well, we're seeing a lot of 18-wheelers coming by here. Is that the kind of truck that he was working with at the time? No, no. It started with a tandem truck, okay. which is a smaller truck. Uh, it's not an 18-wheeler. Um, the, I guess there'd be... Uh, uh, well, not an 18-wheeler, not a, not, a, not a separate unit. It's got the, the tractor part and then the bed right on the back is, mm -hmm. the, is the tandem truck. But there were some 18-wheelers on the road then hauling grain. Just uh, they were hauling from the local elevator and, it was not, and they were not going on the farm to pick up grain direct from the grain bin. So, so it was, was a new it, concept. Was it these trucks going out into the fields? directly that was new or was it the fact that he was taking his truck out in the field and then going right to the terminal to load the grain at the, the terminal on the river? That is correct. What was new was him taking the grain directly from the farm to the terminal, the barge terminal, rather than the farmer hauling their grain to the local elevator and then the local elevator taking it to the barge terminal. Local elevators at that point in time had all of the grain brought to them and they also had storage, which they would store grain for farmers. Uh, when my father started doing uh, the direct ship, uh, then the elevators were used primarily for storage and the, and the grain that was picked up at the grain bins or out of the fields would be hauled directly to the terminal, which provided the farmer with a better price for his grain. Okay. Um but your father was making money. Was he purchasing the grain from the farmer? 
Yes, he was. He had a grain dealer's license, and he was purchasing the grain from the farmer, uh, getting a price from the grain terminals at the Illinois River, uh, taking the trucking, uh, the, the cost of trucking off of that barge terminal bid, plus a margin, then would pass what was left to the farmer, which was more than what they could get at the local elevators at the time. Okay. So he's making more of a profit because you're saving on the elevator storage, and the farmer's making a better profit off of that as well? The farmer was definitely getting a better price, and my father was taking a small margin to, to pay the, the overhead and, and a little bit of profit margin. Okay. Did he purchase these trucks then? He did, yes. How many did he have? Started with one. And Started with one and bought a second, and uh, when I came back, and I'm jumping ahead, but I, I don't want to jump too far, but when I came back in uh, 1991 to the grain business, my father had six semis at that point in time. So he had grown from one to six. And, and semis by that time. And semis by that time, yes. Okay, so obviously the scale operation keeps growing then. Yes, absolutely. And he did a lot of uh, <clears throat> leased trucks too, like at harvest time during the busy, busy times of the year, he would, uh, he would hire some local trucking operations to come in and help. So there was probably at harvest time through the 80s, he would probably operate 15 to 20 semis uh, at harvest time, mm -hmm. not owning them all, but uh, some of the local independent truckers would, would uh, lease on. I don't know that we even mentioned your father's name. My father's name is uh, Robert Paul Johnson. He was born in 1942 as well. Uh, does he go by Bob or Robert? Uh, Bob. Okay. Um, as he got more and more into the grain shipping business, is that what we should call it, a grain shipping? Yes. Yes. Did he get less and less involved with the farm then, a tenant farm? Yes. Um, I would say he continued to do both, but brought in uh, uh, some help to help with the farming operation. So he was overseeing the farm and the grain business as it continued to grow and uh, was not able to do all of the work uh, that he did before he had the grain business. So it was more of a management of both businesses rather than uh, directly involved in both yeah. of them. And obviously, increasingly over time, he's hiring other people to help drive the trucks and manage the business with him. That's correct. Um, the thing that strikes me, though, is you know, there's only about a month or two the corn goes to market, becomes ripe, and then you head over. So what's happening for the rest of the year? Well... The grain, uh, the farmer uh, at harvest time, when he harvests his crop, he has what we call on-farm storage, which if he's got his own grain bins or silos, back in the olden days is what they called them, um, he will put his grain in those grain bins. Um, his remaining bushels that he cannot hold on his own with his own storage, he will take to the country elevator and uh, either store it there or sell it to the country elevator. So the, the country elevators were busy in the, in the fall, and then in the off season would send their trucks out to pick up grain directly from the farm, which I talked about earlier, and my father kind of started that concept. So uh, at harvest time, when I mentioned the six semis in 1991, um, those six semis would, would keep up with hauling out of the grain bins in the off season, and then at harvest time when you needed more trucks, you would then hire the local independent truck drivers to help you. Okay. So it's the grain shipping business, which your dad got into and in, in eventually into a very big way. It's all managing the storage or what's actually in the field. I'm, I'm not saying this very well, but what's intriguing me about this is um, you want to have a steady flow of grain hitting the, uh, the transshipment point, I would think. That is correct. Yes, if you think about the supply and demand of corn, for instance, uh, we need a steady supply throughout the entire year. Um, you know, it may vary a little bit from time to time, but for feed and, and uh, for ethanol usage now and for export usage for, for feed, uh, we, need a steady, we need a steady supply. And if you think about what we do here in Illinois and across the Midwest and across the country is we grow the crop and we, we harvest it in 60 days. And so it is the elevator's uh, storage and also the farmer's storage that holds that grain off of the market until that grain is needed. And they are paid some sort of premium 
most generally to hold that grain off the market. When I say premium, that's without getting too technical, that's carry in the market. Uh, corn is worth more most generally in the spring and summer uh, from a carry standpoint than it is at harvest time. Carry meaning you're just storing it then? Uh, yes, for an, for an, an example, uh, this last harvest corn was probably, you now it's gone up a lot here in the last uh, six months, but at harvest corn was probably 350 a bushel for harvest and you probably could have gotten uh, 380 for like an April, May shipment. So the market is pay, paying you carry to keep that grain off the market and paying you for your storage to hold that grain off the market until the, the demand uh, needs uh, the corn. Well, this is your opportunity being a finance major and being in banking then to explain a little bit more about how the market price is determined and how it fluctuates back and forth and the speculation and uh, that whole thing is a mystery to me and I think to a lot of people. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago I probably could have given you a good answer. Um, <laughs> with what's happened in the last two years, nobody has ever seen, no one has ever seen anything like it. We've made all-time highs on corn, soybeans, and wheat. Uh, it is such a global market now uh, that, um, you know, the weak dollar that we've seen in the last couple of years has, has attributed to increased exports, mm -hmm. making our commodities less expensive to the foreign countries. Uh, the boom in ethanol production with corn has also uh, added a lot of uh, demand uh, to our corn uh, balance sheet. And then uh, we've got several other things with the uh, feed usage has continued to, to rise. Um, so we're in a global market here where we, are, we have a, uh, a worldwide shortage of commodities and a worldwide shortage of protein. Uh, what the market is searching for right now is a rationing point at what at, at what price level do prices need to get to and how long do they need to stay there in order to ration enough demand, cut off enough of that uh, usage that we will not run out of corn. And right now the, the market always seems to overdo that when it's trying to find that point. It always seems like it, it will go further than it needs to, but that's just in the hype of, of making sure you ration mm -hmm. it. What's corn prices today? Corn prices today yeah, are. Go ahead and check it out for us, Jay. Right now we have uh, corn. December corn is worth seven fifty one, down six today, and we've six got six cents. Six cents, and we've got soybeans today at uh, November beans at fifteen ninety seven. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I read recently that corn prices, and I suspect soybean as well have been going up even faster than oil prices and right now we're in the midst of an uh, oil crisis because I think you know crude oil is going something like $144 a barrel now I can like tell that. you right now crude oil is 142.59 right now okay. so corn prices have been going up even faster than oil is that sound right yes yeah. well uh, <laughs> I'd have to figure the percentages but I remember uh, a year ago, uh, crude being at seventy or eighty dollars mm -hmm. a barrel, uh, so they've doubled. And I remember corn prices a year ago being at three fifty to four dollars, so they've doubled. Um, beans were about seven to eight, and they've doubled. So I mm -hmm. think all the commodities have about doubled in the last uh, year to year and a half. And uh, this is uh, a lot of that's due to the uh, the weak dollar on the grain side, and and then in the crude market, you've got not only the weak dollar and, and such global demand, you've got the, uh, um, on the crude and the, the uh, corn and soybeans, I just totally lost my train of thought there, so I'll have to edit that, but. Um, well, let me ask you this question, okay. Jay. <laughs> when you said December corn, what does that mean? December corn is a futures month on the Board of Trade, which, uh, Basically, you've got delivery periods. It's a delivery period on the, on the Board of Trade. So right now, you've got July futures, which would be the nearby, okay? That goes off the board the 15th day of July. Then you've got September, jumps to September. So that would be, what is corn worth delivered in September? Delivered to who? 
delivered to the delivery points that are specified uh, for delivery uh, with the Chicago Board of Trade. Well, so, what, what does that mean? Is this going over to the river and that terminal is that a delivery point? It it can be. Uh, there's delivery points and uh, nor there's delivery points all up and down the river. Okay, there's no delivery points on the rail system. That's been talked about, but the del there's delivery points on the. So on this the is not a delivery point. This is not a delivery point. Okay. Um, I'm kind of jumping around myself, and I apologize for that. Um, let's get it. Let's talk a little bit about what brought you back here. And I think your father purchased a, an elevator in 1991. About maybe that's about the same time. That's how I ended up back here. Uh, I was working for First Chicago, as I mentioned. My father called me and uh, asked me if I had any intentions of coming back. And at that point in time, I was starting to realize some of the benefits of coming back to, to Waverly and coming back to the grain business and coming back closer to my family. And he had mentioned there was an elevator for sale in, in Palmyra. Um, it's called the P&M Elevator. Palm, P stands for Palmyra, M stands for Modesto. And that if uh, I had any interest in coming back, he thought that that ought to be purchased. So uh, I made a decision in the, in the summer of 1991 to, uh, to come back uh, to the, uh, the family operation. And uh, we purchased the uh, Palmyra elevator at that point in time. What was his rationale for going into the elevator business as well? I mentioned earlier that in the 80s, a lot of the uh, competition uh, began to do the same thing, going out and picking up grain on the farm. Uh, as the technology and the farmers began to get faster, uh, more, pro, more uh, uh, intensive with their farming operations, uh, there was a need to uh, have storage closer than the river. Because if you think about a farmer in 1975, when my father started uh, shelling a load of corn in three hours, two, three hours, and having one truck pick up that load of corn and take it to the river and then come back and be able to be there for that farmer when he had his next load of all of his wagons full, okay? In 1985, the farmer was probably shelling a load in, in an hour. So enable, it took so many more trucks to get to the river and get it dumped in, in 10 years later, okay? So the need to continue, uh, I mean, with us having to, to pick up that grain and haul it so far, there was a need arising to, be, to have storage more locally, more local. Mm -hmm. So by buying that elevator, we were able to then pick up the grain on the farm, haul it into the country elevator, in Palmyra, and then we could haul that back out. We'd fill our storage, and then when we got full, then we would haul that during our slow periods, generally in the morning, before the farmers went to the field. So it was all part of managing the flow, so you have a steady flow, a steady delivery. Yes. Where exactly was your dad taking the, the, the uh, grain to the, the river? Um, all up and down the river. Uh, would have went to Beardstown, uh, Meridocia, uh, Naples and Florence. So he delivered in all those places? Yes. Okay. And this is obviously barge terminals is what these All were. of them were barge terminals. Okay. Some of them were owned by Cargill, some of them were owned by Continental at the time, which Cargill bought later. Uh, some were owned by ADM and also uh, Consolidated Grain and Barge. What exactly were you doing when you first started working for your dad? Were you running that Pamira elevator operation? No. Uh, the first thing I did when I came back was uh, I was wanting to learn the entire uh, business and so was my father. So I started in the accounting side and uh, was working with payroll and settlements and paying farmers and stuff like that. And I, about three weeks later, I walked in, my dad tells this story, I walked into my dad's office, I said, Dad, I've got all that down, now I want your job. <laughs> so he was... He was uh, he was more than receptive. He'd uh, he'd been in the business since 1975 and had, had spent a lot of long long hours. And uh, he said, "It's all yours." And he walked out the door. So wow. I uh, I was able to uh, pick up pretty quick on what the grain merchandising was all about. And and uh, he was there for guidance and help. And 
taught me a lot that I needed to know in order to, to get to where we've gotten today. So he signed over the business to you, sold it to you? Huh? No, no, he uh, he still owned it. Uh, okay. We operated at the time under Robert Johnson Grain Incorporated, okay? And um, he, he owned it, and uh, it wasn't long that uh, I was doing the merchandising. Now, he was still... He was still making the big decisions, there's no doubt about that. So he basically just, just gave me his desk and said, uh, start buying grain and, and uh, learn the merchandising. And, and uh, as we continued, uh, I don't want to get ahead of you, so let me stop there and you can ask your next well, question. <laughs> I was going to say, what you're not doing though, Jay, is you're not scooping grain, are you? That's right. That's right. I, I got beyond that. So I wanted to make sure that when he had called me when I was in Chicago that that wasn't going to be my job. <laughs> <laughs> that went through your mind, huh? That, yes, it did. So where in this process did you get married? I got married in 1994, uh, April 23rd of 1994. And um, it's actually, uh, we had gone out since uh, 1988. Uh, so I, had, uh, I met my wife in college. I uh, knew her through my stint in Chicago, and that was actually where she was from. She was from Elmhurst. Okay, so she's a, a big city, a suburban girl. What's her last name? Rufa, R-U-F-A. Okay. There's a more ethnic mixture here. Yeah, that's there? right. I think there's a little German there. Okay. Um, what was her thoughts about, okay, I'm dating this guy who's living in rural Waverly, Illinois. Was that a hard adjustment for her? <laughs> Well, when I went to Chicago, she loved it because she thought, well, when I graduate, then we can live in Chicago. And when I got up there and realized it wasn't for me and realized that I wanted to come back to the, to the family grain operation, I told her that I was moving back to Waverly and asked her if she would like to uh, consider that as, as we got married and come that down here. That sounds very romantic. Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I... I couldn't believe it, but she said she'd do it. She'd go anywhere. So that that's when I knew that I at least I uh, I think I had the right woman, and uh, found out later that that I did. So okay, super. Um, let's talk then about some more development of the business. Then ninety one was a big year, um, and not too long after that, handed over the reins from your father to you. Uh, what's the next big step? The next big step is uh, uh, in nineteen ninety six. Uh, we continued to grow. We actually went from about six semis in 1991 to, I think at our peak point, probably in 95 or 96, we had 18 of our own. So we, once we, once we took over the uh, Tom Meyer elevator, things continued to, to grow at that point in time. So in 1996, we had the need for more storage and also another outlet to dump corn at harvest time. So we purchased the, uh, the abandoned Waverly elevator that had been shut down sometime in the mid 80s and uh, we were able to purchase that and renovate that and uh, we turned that into a into a uh, uh, basically our own little dumping uh, elevator we we turned it several times which means we we filled it up it didn't have a lot of storage but we would fill it up and haul the grain back out it would be a, a place close mm -hmm. so that we could dump our trucks during the busy time so how far is Palmyra from here Palmyra would be about 14 miles from here. Okay. We're three miles uh, east of Waverly. Palmyra is 11 miles directly south of Waverly. What's the capacity of the Palmyra elevator? Palmyra elevator holds about right at a million bushels. For the novice, is that a big operation? No, no. Uh, by comparison, we uh, hold 10 and a half million here. At just this at this facility. one shuttle facility that we're, that we're sitting at right now. So we, we had a million at Palmyra and we have about 500 to 600,000 at Waverly. At that elevator we built in 96 and I'm jumping ahead of you, but we've got 10 and a half million bushels mm -hmm. here. 96, so you're just increasing the volume, but basically you're doing the same kind of things. Same thing, just uh, providing, uh, providing the service to the farmers and uh, growing and uh, uh, just trying to do everything we can to keep trucks to the farmers at harvest time. Did you uh, find that your two elevators you have in 96, did you have to go to other elevators to haul grain as well to keep your keep all these trucks busy? 
we would uh, no we were able to keep the trucks busy uh with the farmer storage in the off season and okay. harvest time we needed all the trucks we could find i remember back in probably 98 or 99 i was dispatching trucks that was part of my job too is is the logistics of dispatching trucks and i think on a saturday one day when a lot a lot of the local truckers would would be busy during the week they would be hauling on their normal runs because they needed to stay busy year-round too so we were able to pick up some trucks but we had uh, access to, to several trucks on the weekends and I think on one Saturday I was dispatching like 53 semis in 1988 or 1999 and that was uh, 88 or 98 uh, 98 okay. okay yeah or 99 one of those years it was it was pretty crazy well, that sounds to me like a massive scale here. Yeah, what's the number of bushels that one of these 18 wheelers, these, these semis, can hold? Uh, anywhere between 925 and 975 bushel is a legal load. Okay. Well, that puts things in perspective. If you can store roughly a million bushels at Palmyra and you've got 10 plus million here, that's a lot of truckloads then. That's a lot of truckloads. What would you say the average, and this is probably a misnomer, but the average farmer would store on his farm? The average farmer on his farm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it in percentages. I'm going to say that there's probably, a, a, out of the crop that's grown here, probably 40 to 50% of it is on farm storage. Now, the reason why I, it's hard to say the average is because there's small farmers, medium farmers, and large farmers. So a small farmer that grows, you know, 50,000 bushels of corn a year and maybe store tw half of it, be 25. Then you've got, uh, you know, if you figure uh, a 1,000 acre farmer, corn farmer, grows 200 bushels the acre, he's got 200,000 bushels of corn to do something with. So he may have 100,000 bushels of storage. There might be some farmers that can store it all, and there might be some farmers that can't store any. Mm -hmm. But on average, probably almost half of it is on farm storage. If they store their own, that means that gives them the latitude to play the market and determine when the best price to sell their corn is? It gives them two things. It gives them the ability to, uh, to pick their price or to sell at a later date, or they can still sell that corn ahead of time and pick up the carry in the market. For instance, if they like the price in the summer prior to harvest, rather than selling it at 350 last harvest, they're going to sell it at 380 for say April and picked up that 30 cents, okay? So that you get 30 cents for your your storage. But you've also got the interest against that commodity between harvest and, and April. So in to net out maybe uh, 15 cents extra for his storage. Yeah. So all Several this, ways to play it. All this suggests that even the average farmer anymore has to have a business degree or a really good foundation in understanding the marketplace. Absolutely. The, the farmers uh, that did not have uh, the education or the business uh, have, uh, have either consolidated with other farmers or have chose to do something else because they couldn't grow at the pace they needed to compete in the times of, of uh, mm -hmm. corporate farming is yeah. really what it's coming to. What's the uh, next step after 1996 as far as your business is concerned? In 1996, uh, we built the elevator. We continued to grow. And we desperately needed some storage in, uh, in the late 90s. We were, we were tapping out our two elevators again. And there was nothing for sale. And there was nothing close that we needed. So we decided to build a 1.7 million bushel flat storage or ground pile just east of Waverly and, and, and cover it with a tarp. So we constructed some concrete walls and covered the corn with a tarp and, that allowed, and we put scales there so we could haul the corn in at harvest time and store that corn in the flat storage. And that helped us get by again. We continued to just do things as we needed to and that helped us get by again. Uh, what was interesting about uh, the 2000 move to build that flat storage is we were really wanting to do something close to our main office, which was just by my parents' house, is where we're close to right now. And we chose not to because we found a location that, that we thought would work better. 
and as time t progresses here then we end up uh, with the opportunity to build here and uh, I'll get into that when, when you well, get to it. I think we're it. pretty close to that now are we not? Well let me let me proceed then. We uh, after we built that flat storage in 2000 in 2003 <clears throat> the railroad, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad, which runs right by my parents' house and right by our main office, and we own property right alongside adjacent to the railroad. Uh, they were looking for uh, corn to be shipped down to Texas and Mexico for cattle feed. Uh, prior to 2003, most of the corn was coming from the western states of Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, uh, the Dakotas were coming from there going down to uh, feed that market but then the ethanol plant the ethanol boom in the early 2000s in those states uh, which started out in the west because of the of the cheaper basis which I won't get into that's a little technical but that's where the ethanol plants were naturally naturally began because of the the cost of grain on a basis level um, were taking most of the corn so uh, we were able to then, when the Burlington Northern said we need to go further east to get our corn to satisfy this feed market, we were we were in a uh, in a in a good spot to then build a facility close to our main office, which we needed, and we also had property adjacent to the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad, so it was a perfect fit to do that uh, in 2003. The railroad came to you, or you went to them? Well, I went to them because we were not uh, we were not on the railroad. We did not have a uh, country elevator on a rail. So basically, the Burlington Northern looked at their maps and said, "Okay, here's a grain elevator on the on the rail line. Here's another one." So they went to visit all those, and I was able to pick pick up the conversation that that's what they were looking for, and I contacted them and told them that we didn't have a facility on the railroad, but we would sure build one if they wanted to uh, to build one here. And the reason why it was such a uh, great opportunity to do so is the, the Burlington Northern was so eager to have facilities built in Illinois that they were providing some economic development incentive money to uh, people to do that. However, they didn't want to put economic development money into just anywhere, any place. You had to fit the right uh, credentials. Uh, you had to show, prove to them how you could provide the most grain at the least amount of cost. Mm -hmm. And uh, they selected five Illinois facilities that uh, um, submitted proposals. And they selected, uh, we were the only uh, Central Illinois shuttle loader selected. Uh, here um, we were the furthest south southern shuttle loader in Illinois the others would have been the first one built in Ransom Illinois which is which I'm north close to Kankakee then you've got uh, the second one would have been uh, Mendota which is right on Interstate 39 north of Bloomington between Bloomington and Rockford third one is Toluca which is Rough Brothers there at Toluca that is just north of Bloomington and then you've got one up at, at Galva, which is up uh, north northwest part of the state, and uh, then here in Waverly. And we were actually the third. Uh, Ransom, Mendota, Waverly, uh, Toluca, and Galva was the order in which they were built. So you've got this relationship with the Burlington Northern Santa Fe. They built a spur here at this particular facility then? We actually built a spur. The railroad... Uh, had the main line going by and we were responsible to do everything else. So we built the, the, we bought the switches, purchased the switches to get off of the main line and built the spur which is a mile and a third uh, oval loop track so the entire train can pull in and be loaded which we'll view later. Yeah. Uh, we are loading a train here today which is nice. Um, this might be a question you don't want to answer but I'll ask you anyway. Uh, just looking out the window and seeing the scale of this operation, this is no small facility you've got here, and the rail line itself had to be expensive. What kind of money were we talking about that it cost to build this entire facility here? Well, we did it in, in phases. Um, 
we've actually up to about phase seven right now and, and continue to add. But phase one of the operation when we first began was about eight million. And uh, we've since uh, uh, added, uh, expanded each year. And to build an operation of this, uh, of this size and magnitude today would probably cost you somewhere around 25 million. And we don't have quite that much in it because of the, you know, when we built, steel prices were less. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were we actually built at a, at a, at a really good time for, for the cost of steel. And yet you still consider yourself a small businessman. Absolutely, absolutely. When you look at some of the large uh, operations like Cargill and ADM, we're, mm -hmm. we're, uh, we're very, very small. Um, so I, we've seen a constant flow of trucks going by here, and the rail cars are in the background moving right now. Um, okay, now I've kind of lost my train of thought. Um, the, the scale of it is, is impressive to me. 110 car trains is what comes through here? Yes. And how quickly can you load up that, that train? Well, it's, uh, it's 110 cars. Each car holds 4,000 bushels of corn. So that's about about five, four and a half to five semi-loads, 18 wheelers to fill one car. And there's 110 of those. So there's 440,000 bushels on a train load, which is about 500 semi-loads. So as you see the trucks coming in and out today, we'll probably dump about 200 semis today. And it takes about 500 to fill a train. So we'll dump the, the corn that comes in from the trucks and also pull the, the balance of what we need to fill the train out of our storage. So the capacity in one train load is what again? 440,000 bushels. And how often do you uh, load a train? We load a train uh, depending on the time of year. At harvest time we load more, but I'm going to say we average about one and a half a week and this year we'll load about 80 trains this year. Oh. What happens to the trains after they depart from here? They go uh, northwest uh, to Galesburg, believe it or not. We're going to the, Texas, but, <laughs> but we go northwest to Galesburg. And the reason why they go to Galesburg is there's a kind of like a railroad interstate, I guess you'd call yeah, it. They call the it the Transcon. It yeah, they've got, uh, a, a, they got traffic going both ways. So they, they call it a Transcon. You can move both directions, and the train is a straight shot without having to wait. As you see on our line here, which is right out, the back, um, it's a single line to Galesburg. So if you if the trains meet, one of them has to pull off on a siding. Well, the other one passes, and when it gets to Galesburg, it can shoot straight down to Texas without uh, without stopping for feed, primarily cattle feed. Now there are some ethanol plants being built down in Texas right now. There's three of them under construction that we will actually be providing some corn for those ethanol ethanol plants down in Texas as well. I just heard a couple of days ago that the ethanol plant that was being planned for Waverly has at least been put on hiatus for now. That is correct. The, the market environment is such that if you haven't begun to build a uh, ethanol plant, you don't want to start with corn at almost $8 a bushel. So it's not no longer as economical to uh, to produce ethanol with that corn? The margins have definitely slipped. Now, we were a part of that group that was going to build the ethanol plant here, and really what our play was in that is to provide the corn. We were going to provide the land, and we were going to provide the origination of the corn in order to, to, uh, to run that plant. Mm -hmm. um, there was a group of uh, Knoxville investors that were wanting to get into the ethanol business, and we, we were able to seek them out in order to provide the corn for the ethanol plant, which is not, not uh, no longer feasible due to the, the shrinking margins. Um, put you on the spot here, Jay. Mm -hmm. If you were to, if you were to guess, if you were to make your educated guess, what's caused the price of grain to go up? Is it the overseas markets? Is it uh, ethanol production? Is it uh, speculation? It's a combination of everything. Um, what would be the biggest pressure on it, do you think? Uh, probably the, the ethanol. Um, and, I, and I know there's a huge food versus fuel debate. Um, at the time when ethanol was being made with corn, um, the 
our exports weren't as large because the dollar was not near as weak. And once the margins got large in ethanol, and the reason why they got fairly large is because the co price of corn was so low because we had a surplus, mm -hmm. okay? Just like in anything, when something's good, it always gets overbuilt. And nobody's going to get into anything that's got good margins in it very long because everybody's going to enter that market. So what happened was we had a bunch of ethanol plants that were announced and going to be built because the margins were good. And at the same time, the uh, dollar continued to get weak. And the speculators came in, and I say the large index funds, and have totally ran this market up. Now, have they taken it too far? Only time will tell. Because we don't know really where that price is that rations enough demand to keep the balance sheet at tolerable levels. Mm -hmm. Okay? I think I heard you say, and this intrigues me, that even though ethanol production has increased dramatically in the United States over the last 10 years, let's say, and that means a lot more grain is being diverted to make ethanol than before. You're still sending more overseas than you have before? Yes. Um, we're not, but the, the country as a whole yeah. is, is still increasing exports, yes. And where are those exports going? Mainly Asia, big markets, uh, Japan, China, uh, some to, to Africa, a uh, little bit to Europe, but primarily to the, to the huge populations in, in China and Japan. And they're obviously using that for uh, um, livestock feed? The majority of it. Uh, I think they've got some, use some of it for some food ingredients, but the majority of it would be for, for protein for, and uh, feed for cattle and, mm -hmm. and uh, whatever other livestock that uh, they need for their protein. Well, let's talk about some of the other ways that you've diversified. If you could spend just a couple minutes of other different kinds of businesses that you've gotten into as well or offshoots of this main business. In 2000, I mentioned the need for uh, some more storage, and we built that ground pile. And it looked like at that point in time that it's kind of interesting how all this develops. It looked like at that point in time that we were going to need to make some huge expenditures um, real soon. And I was concerned of being able to, with the margins we were able to get and the profits we were able to, to make and the late 90s and around 2000 was not significant enough to be able to expand at the pace that we need to expand. Uh, so I was fearful that the, that the future on the grain business for me uh, wasn't that bright at that point in time. Even though we were growing, our margins were shrinking and we had a, f uh, a lot of outside competition. So at that point in time I, I diversified into, I started up an, an asset business uh, a hedge fund business, which I had had some experience uh, in in college. I was on the uh, educational investment fund team, which uh, was a, was a chosen team in uh, in college where I got a lot of knowledge. And through working with markets for for ten years, I was uh, able to learn quite a little bit about hedging strategies. So I started an investment fund in two thousand and. Uh, then in uh, 2001, uh, I started an insurance agency, which was primarily selling uh, crop insurance to the farmers. Mm -hmm. I tried to find businesses that I could uh, provide uh, better service to the clientele that we already had. Um, I also, and through this entire time, sold Pioneer Seed Corn from 1993 to 2004, which I had to give up in 04 when we started this shuttle operation. So. Uh, there's been several things that, uh, that I've done to diversify and, uh, and uh, has allowed this, uh, this uh, shuttle to happen as I was able to, to make some, some uh, capital in those other businesses to help, uh, help build this shuttle for our community and for our area farmers. But the margin that you were concerned about a few years ago has improved a little bit for you lately? Yes, it has, and it needs to because of the amount of uh, investment mm -hmm. that we've got here. I mean, when you figure what it costs to build this and the, and the overhead 
that it takes to operate a facility of this size, even though we're still small, still still big in, in our world, and uh, it's, it's pretty intensive. So yes, the margins have gotten better, um, but also the, the risk uh, is, is uh, enhanced greatly as well. Well, let's finish off with this. We've got a lot to talk about when we go out and actually look at the facility, and that's that's going to be a lot of fun for me just to kind of walk around and, you know, be overwhelmed by the scale of things. But you've hinted around at this a little bit. What's the future of the family farm? You know, you've kind of talked about your progression in your family. What's the future of the average family farm? Well, I would say that uh, you either need to grow or, or get out is really what it's come to, and that's unfortunate. Uh, but it's the way of the world. In every business, uh, uh, progress is, is inevitable. Progress is good. Progress can be bad. Um, but it's got more benefits than, than uh, and we hate to see the family farm uh, suffer, but in this day and age, you really need to farm a lot of acres in order to, to, uh, to make it work. Uh, margins on, on uh, per acre are on average less than they used to be. Now this year is an exception because of the high price of grain, but that won't last either. Yeah, That will come back down as well. Okay, um, thank you Jay. We'll pick this up this afternoon and have fun okay. with it. Thank you. You know, I went through that whole thing. I didn't mention my kids. <laughs>